Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Harris. I'm with the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. I would like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series, uh, which normally takes place the first Tuesday of each month at 9 a.m. Um, as a PPA member, this is a this is a free benefit for for you to take advantage of. We've been we've been doing this for um, a little bit over two years on a monthly basis. So we will be releasing our our 2020 schedule here, uh, hopefully in the next uh, month or so. Um, before we begin our webinar today, I would like to encourage you to ask questions through the question feature and go to webinar. Uh, you should see that you should see a question option uh, on the on the go to webinar um, uh, platform. Uh, you're going to be on mute the entire time, so the only way for you to ask a question is through is through typing it in through the go to webinar um, um, uh, screen that you see on your page. Uh, what we'll do during or after the webinar, we will will take your questions. I will I will ask them to Mike, and I'm sure he can uh, provide some some insight. If for some reason uh, we don't get to your question, um, or we need to connect you after the fact to get you an answer, we'll make sure that we do that. So at this point, I would like to introduce our presenter, Mike Curis. Uh, Mike is the senior safety consultant with East Coast Risk Management. Uh, and the topic that Mike's going to be covering today is preparing for the new FMCSA drug and alcohol clearinghouse, which is which is a topic that pertains to all of our members. So um, uh, at this point, Mike, I would like to pass it off to you. Thanks, Ted. Um, as Ted said, uh, my name is Mike Curis. I work for a company called East Coast Risk Management, uh, also part of Keystone Risk Management. Uh, and what we're going to begin over today is the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. And this is a important subject um, because the start date is coming up very, very soon. <clears throat> and actually, for whatever reason, I feel like that they've done the FMCSA has done a poor job of actually po putting or pointing out um, the new requirements that are coming up. So I hope this webinar um, should answer most of your questions. At the very end of the webinar, uh, we do a frequently asked question session. Um, and the questions that I chose, I feel like, are the ones that were asked the most. Okay, so the objectives we have today, um, we're going to go over the clearinghouse final role, the timeline leading up to and beyond the implementation, how to use the clearinghouse, frequently asked questions, how to actually register for the clearinghouse, and then additional resources and information. <coughs> So what is the clearinghouse? So it's actually something that was mandated by Congress. And uh, the reason it was put in place is because basically right now the way it's set up um, is if I was a driver working for ABC Trucking and wanted to work for somebody down the street because I filled a drug test at the current employer, basically right now the way it's set up, if I don't put that employer's name on my application, there's no way for the current employer to find out that I actually failed a previous drug test. Um, as I discussed earlier, the implementation is coming up here in January 6, 2020. So like I discussed before, traveling to violations, the current process is a paper format. Um, it also requires the drivers to self-report. Um, so why would the driver tell on himself, basically? Um, you probably see something like this right now that you guys currently use. Um, this would be the paper format. Like I said, basically what you would do is based off of your application from the employee, you would send this off to every employer that they've worked for for the previous three years. Um, now, however, this is not gonna change for the next three years. So basically from January 6, 2020, we actually have to use the clearinghouse and we have to send this out for the previous three years for the next three years. Um, and basically we're doing that for three years for the reason that we need the clearinghouse to get all the information that it needs to have in there. Um, after the three years, so in 2023, you will no longer have to do the paper format. The problems we see, going back to this real quick, um, is we send this out, we don't hear back from the previous employers. Um, a lot of times the previous employers don't even know what this means. They'll just rip it up and throw it away. 
Um, the clearinghouse is going to clear all that up, and it's going to be something that's going to be right in front of your face, basically. Okay, so um, the database, it's going to be, like I said, it's a website. Basically, what this is going to show is drivers can log in, and whether you're a drug and alcohol testing facility, a substance abuse professional, or actually the employer themselves, uh, everybody's going to actually have access to this website. Um, what you're actually going to report is going to be positive tests or refusals. Refusal, remember, is the same as a positive test. If somebody does actually test positive, um, you're actually going to be putting in the return to duty process as well. And then as well as the employer, like I said, the employee should also have access to this. Now, getting into the actual employee part of it, we will get into a little bit later. It's not necessary for current employees to actually register and be a part of the clearinghouse. However, for me personally, and I'll get into it, I believe that it's necessary because if there was wrong information put in about an employee um, or anytime anything is updated about an employee, um, they will be notified through the website. And like I said, if something's wrong, they could actually log in themselves and update that. So here's the timeline here. Uh, December 5th, 2016 is actually when the final rule was published. So this is nothing new. Um, however, most people have not heard about this until probably right now. Um, so like I said, I do feel that the FMCSA has done a poor job on uh, announcing this. Um, however, their website, which I'll give you guys later, <clears throat> is very informative. And there is a lot of good information on there as far as frequently asked questions. I believe they have over 100 questions that uh, have been frequently asked with answers. And as discussed, January 6, 2020 is when this actually will go into place. As of right now, the registration is open. You can go on the website today and uh, register, whether you're an employee or an employer. And as discussed a little earlier, in 2023 is when the, the implementation will go into place to where you do no, no longer have to do the paper format. So from January 6, 2020 to January 6, 2023, we'll have to continue the paper format. So actually using the clearinghouse. So who will actually, who's actually required to use it? And that's gonna be anybody with CL, or CDLs or CLP. The CLP is a, is a learner's permit. Uh, employers of CDL drivers who operate commercial motor vehicles, any third party consortiums, MROs or medical review officers, substance abuse professionals, and state driver's license agencies. As discussed, the registration is now open. It is pretty simple uh, to go on and they walk you through it very simply um, on how to, whether you're an employee or employer, the process is the same. Um, they also have detailed instructions in a PDF format um, that you're able to get from the website that you could actually provide to your employees uh, if necessary. Okay, so actually reporting to the website. <coughs> so like I said earlier, employers, third parties, and MR MROs are going to be required to report any drug and alcohol testing that comes up positive or refusal. Um, substance abuse professionals are going to be required to report information about drivers undergoing the mandatory return to duty process. The current process right now is the return to duty is what they call follow-up testing. You have to do six randoms over the next 12 months at minimum. A lot of times what you'll see is substance abuse professionals will go past that point. Um, and once they, they put the plan in place, the plan is the plan. So all that kind of stuff is updated and put into the system. As discussed earlier, every time that the information is added or modified or removed, whatever it may be, uh, the FMCSA will notify the driver However, if they do not have a registration or if they're not registered with the website, then basically what will happen is they'll receive a paper format throughout the actual mail. Um, that's why I think it's not a bad idea to have everybody in your company registered. Okay, so what, when you're pulling information on an employee, so that's prospective employee or current employees, what they call is a query. Okay, so basically right now, if you have 10 employees, all CDL drivers, we wouldn't have to pull their information until next year. 
it's an annual query. Um, at that point in time, all they really need to do is fill out a paper form stating that they that you could pull it in the within the paper form too, you could list whether it's one query or unlimited queries, whatever it may be, but the, the employee has to sign off on it. So that's why I was saying earlier, you technically for your current employees don't have to have them register. Um, you would just have them sign off on this paper format. However, for any new hire coming on to work at your company, they have to do what they call a full query. When you do a full query, you actually have to do an electronic consent as an employee. So when they're going into the actual system, they're actually going to consent to say that, yes, you can pull their information. Um, for your current employees, like I discussed, this is a simple paper format. Actually, the, the FMCSA has a sample on their website. Um, my suggestion is, though, like I said, you can list it out for one query, two queries, or uh, unlimited. It's up to you, however you want it to word it. My uh, suggestion, though, would be to put this in our new hire paperwork and spell it out saying that this would be for the life of the employee. This makes it that much easier. If you have the employee's signature, then you're golden. Um, if for whatever reason the employee has an issue with it, um, then you guys could, you know, change the, the paper form and however you'd like to, but um, I think it would just be better if you put it for the life of employment. Hey, Mike. Yes. Hey, we, so we just had a question come in. <clears throat> do drivers have to have an email address in order to do this? So I participate in this. And, you know, the topic, which I think uh, – He's bringing up in, a, in another point that most of our drivers, you know, or a decent amount of our drivers don't have email addresses, which I think applies for um, probably a decent chunk of our membership as well. Yeah, that, that's uh, a little bit of an issue. Uh, I went to actually a seminar that the FMCSA put on. Uh, there was three members from the FMCSA there. Uh, when they went over the subject, their suggestion was, to have a computer available for the employees to use, um, which basically means, yes, they do have to have an email address and they have to have access to the internet, obviously. So if you learn the process for new hires coming on, um, everybody's gonna run, run into this problem, especially in the beginning to where you're gonna wanna hire a new person. You're gonna say, hey, can you log on and consent uh, for us to pull your, your past information and they're going to say what are you talking about because i never heard about that <clears throat> in that situation we're going to have to kind of guide them and help them you know maybe get them a gmail account um and then actually have a computer available for them to actually register is it a pain absolutely but it is a mandatory situation um and it just they basically just <laughs> said it is what it is you have to do it which i know that doesn't help a lot of people but that's just the uh the regulation yep understood and just to clarify that's for that's for any new hire you know if you have 10 drivers right now they don't it, it's optional for them to do so but they don't need to go and set up email addresses if they don't have them yeah for the the new the drivers that are currently on staff all you need is this paper format right here so if you have them currently sign off um now the other issue that you could run into as well though if you pull a limited query is what it's called, if you're pulling limited queries, basically all it shows is pass or fail. So it says this driver's good or this driver's not good. In the situation where it said this driver's not good and you have this paper format, at that point in time, they would have to register actually and you have to pull a full query on the person because you can see what the issue actually is. So that's why, like I said, I think it'd just be easier to get it out of the way in the beginning. However, for current drivers, you only have to have the paper format. Okay, thank you. This is kind of the information that you're gonna see. Uh, if you see up top here, prohibited from driving, this is what they call the limited query. So if I was pulling this information on my current drivers, this is what you would see, prohibited from driving if there was an issue. At this point in time that I see this, then I would have to ask for electronic consent and pull a full query on this person. So nothing's free. Um, so employers basically get to choose two types of query plans. 
Unlimited queries could be $2,500 for the year or a flat fee of $1.25. Now, for the $2,500 to work, you have to have a lot of employees, obviously. Um, however, they do have plans that you can put into to place. So for instance, if you have 10 or 50 drivers, whatever it may be, rather than putting your, your credit card information in every single time you want to pull a query, what you can do is purchase them up front. So you could do a bundle, what they call However, you're not saving money with the bundle. It's still $1.25 per query. You're just paying for more upfront. So they suggest basically to make it easier on yourself when we get registered to buy a bundle um, so you have them readily available to use. So with any sort of new regulation coming out, I actually like to show the regulations. And I know that Ted's gonna actually send this out to everybody. So if you had more questions or wanted to research this yourself, um, here's all the new regulation that's been put into place um, in the drug and alcohol regulation through the FMCSA, which is 382. Okay, this is the section here that I think is probably gonna be uh, the most useful information of what we discussed. So I gave a high level overview. Um, these questions here, like I said, are the most frequently asked. Um, so let me go through this, and then I'm sure everybody will have some more questions to add to this, um, and I will be happy to answer those questions. So what types of drivers and employers will the clearinghouse affect? So this is a big issue right now, um, and but they make it simple. All CDL drivers, with whether it's CDL or CLP, if you employ CDL drivers, you actually, I mean, you have to pull this on them annually. And then for new hires, you have to do the full query like we discussed earlier, uh, especially even municipal vehicles. So a lot of times people think, well, actually there is, there's a lot of um, relief from regulation with municipalities. Uh, in this situation, there's no relief from regulation. You have to do it. Uh, even um, passenger drivers. <laughs> so school bus drivers, whatever it may be. Uh, if you hold a CDL, you have to go through the process. Will violations that occur before the rule is implemented be included in the clearinghouse? So for instance, today is you know December, it's, it's the beginning of December, January 6th is when the, this goes into place. So if I failed to test today, would that information go in the, the clearinghouse? The answer is no. Only violations occurring on or after January 6th will end up in that clearinghouse. How long would the driver violations be available in the clearinghouse? So in this situation, it's actually gonna be there for five years or until the driver does the return to duty process. But as discussed earlier, the return to duty process means if I fail to test, this goes for any CDL driver, to clear my name, I have to go seek help from a substance abuse professional. That substance abuse professional then lays out a plan for me to do X amount of randoms, and like I said earlier, the, the minimum is six randoms over 12 months. Uh, once that's complete, then my name would get cleared, or I would wait five years, and it would wipe my, my uh, name clean. Are social security numbers required to enter uh, driver violations? And that answer is no. Uh, it's all based off of the CDL number and the issuing state. Um, there was a question before about what if a driver has multiple licenses in, in multiple states? Um, they do have some sort of way of tracking that type of deal. Um, so the, the driver wouldn't be able to get away with, you know, failing in one state, moving to the next state. Um, they put processes in place to actually um, make sure that that does not happen. As discussed earlier, every driver does not need to get, need to register for the clearinghouse. However, like I said, it makes it a lot easier on you. Also, if you have a driver, I know that this is probably not a worry that you would have, but <clears throat> if a driver were to leave your company and go to another company, they would have to register. But just to prevent any sort of hiccups that you would have, like I said, if we pulled a query on somebody and, and there was an issue, they would have to register anyways. So I always think that the employer should push the employees to actually register. Can an employer register their drivers in the clearinghouse? And the answer is no. Each individual actually has to, to do the registration themselves. 
Um, like I said, the process is not hard, especially for an employee. Uh, you're not entering any sort of DOT numbers or anything like that. It is a simple process. You get the login. As far as an employee goes, you're, ne you're probably never even going to log in um, unless there's some sort of issue or you're trying to get a new job. Um, going back to what I said about earlier about the FMCSA, if you had like a laptop or something like that available for the employees to use, um, that's that's basically what I would do. Are employers of non-CDL drivers who operate commercial motor vehicles required to query or report violations to the clearinghouse? And that's no. They only care about CDL drivers. That is it. So if you have 20 drivers, only 10 of those are CDL drivers. Um, you know, a lot of DOT regulations still deals with non-CDL drivers, be maybe because they're driving commercial motor vehicles. You know, like driver qualification files or whatever else you know uh, pertains to them. However, this situation does not pertain to them. The drug and alcohol clearinghouse is only for CDL drivers. So what happens when there is a drug and alcohol violation information following a limited query? So what that means, um, if I pulled a limited query, as I showed you earlier, it said the driver was prohibited to drive. At that point in time, we need to pull the full query on the driver. The full query is actually gonna show us all the information. So this driver test positive for X, whatever it may be. This actually has to be done within 24 hours of finding out. So when I do the limited query on my current driver, I find out that there's some sort of issue. I need to pull this within 24 hours. At that point in time, we talked about the electronic consent. The driver has to do the electronic consent. This has to be done within 24 hours. And if they refuse, then that's the same as a positive, basically. And the driver's not permitted to drive the commercial motor vehicle at that point until you go through the process. Owner operator. Once again, a lot of times with owner operators, they are exempt from a lot of stuff. However, same rules apply to them. It's actually, um, you're able to hire third parties to pull this type of information on on, um, on your drivers. So any company can hire a third party to, to do this. However, owner operators have to hire a third party to do this um, so that they're not pulling the information on themselves. Well, a driver hey, follow-up testing for, yes. Hey, so actually just a question that I've gotten before on this, and I just want to clarify with you and, and hopefully everyone else can benefit from this, but if you are working with a third party right now um, to handle some of your FM, FMCSA you know, regulations and just administrative efforts, you still as the employer of the CDL uh, individual need to register through this clearinghouse. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, there is okay. ways on there once you actually get registered to give somebody else permission to conduct them for you. But you as a company still have to register, absolutely. Good Thank question. You. Will a driver's follow-up testing plan be available on the clearinghouse? And the answer is no. <clears throat> like I said, the only thing that goes into the clearinghouse is positive tests, basically. So the testing plan could be you know, 15 randoms over the next five years, let's just say. That plan wouldn't be available for you to see. Uh, however, if, you, if they fail a test, obviously that's gonna go in. Or if a person doesn't show up for a test on a scheduled test, that would end up showing up in, in the uh, clearinghouse. So what information must employers report to the clearinghouse? So this is gonna be alcohol confirmation tests that are 0.04 or greater negative return to duty test results, driver's refusal to submit DOT drug and alcohol tests, and then successful completion of all follow-up tests. So once you actually get through that follow-up testing, um, at the very end, you would put the completion of um, all the follow-up tests. How much time does an employer have to submit a report to the clearinghouse? And that's the close of the third business day. After that, you were basically in violation. How is the driver violation and return to duty information recorded in the clearinghouse for 382, which is the drug and alcohol regulation? The following individuals report the following information. So employers or third party consortiums 
uh, acting on behalf of an employer and their drug and alcohol program violation information into the clearinghouse, medical review officers as well, substance abuse professionals, and then employers will actually enter the negative return of duty test results. So basically through this process, only one of these following have to actually report it. So for instance, if I go get a test done and my third party that actually does the testing puts my information in there, then the employer does not have to. However, you need to make sure that you do your due diligence to make sure that that information was added though. The MRO responsibilities within two business days is that they have to report a positive test, refusal to test, and then whether somebody altered or did a substitution of a specimen. The substance abuse professional responsibilities, um, they have to put the staff's contact information in there, the driver's name, date of birth, and CDL number and state of itch issuance. Uh, the date of driver's initial assessment, and then the date that the substance abuse professional determined that the driver successfully demonstrated compliance with the program and is eligible for return of duty. Um, the drivers must also, so right now, the process for a substance abuse professional is there's many different ways, but they have to be DOT um, SAP. So right now there's a website, it's called saplist.com that you can go on um, and basically seek, seek help. However, moving forward from January 6th on, you have to seek help with the substance abuse professional through the Clearinghouse website. They'll actually have approved vendors um, listed on their website. So how does the, the driver themselves change or remove inaccurate data? So the driver would have to submit a p petition, and this is why, like I said earlier, I think it's important that they have a login. Um, I, if anybody currently is, is uh, up to date with how to contest a violation, it's through the data queue website. And actually a driver would be doing the same thing through that data queue website to pull the information off. So for instance, say I was tested, it came up negative, however, somehow it showed up as a positive um, on my clearinghouse registration. Um, I would have to petition that through the data queue website and then it would be taken off. So what information may be challenged by the driver and that's the accuracy of the information reported, uh, the report of employer's actual knowledge the driver received the traffic violation or citation for driving a commercial motor vehicle while under the influence of drugs or alcohol if it did not result in a conviction. So let me give you an example. I get pulled over last night. Um, you're supposed to be innocent until, you know, um, proven guilty. So you go through the process, you're actually shown as not guilty. Uh, for some reason, that actually ended up on your, your registration. Um, that could be actually removed. The accuracy of test results and refusals may not be challenged. So as I discussed earlier, right now, we should be actually logging in and registering, whether you're an employee or an employer. Um, you wanna be proactive, we should do this ASAP. Uh, it is a pretty easy process. Um, this is kind of what you're looking at right now. Uh, if, whether you're a driver or an employer, you see you can just actually check off which one you are, uh, or a third party or a medical review officer or a substance abuse professional. So the process is the same for everybody. One thing that you have to have to actually log into the clearinghouse and register is an FMCSA portal account. If you do not have a portal account, you have to make one. When you actually go into your portal, this is kind of the screen, and I'm sorry that it's a little pixelated. Um, you actually have to release yourself to be able to, to use the clearinghouse. When you go in, what you'll see is D-A-C-H, and that's Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. When you go into your portal account, you wanna highlight those and add your role. When you add the role, then basically at that point, your registration in the clearinghouse, you'd be able to use it. This is the website that you go to, and like I said, there is so much good information, honestly, in that website. I, I definitely think that everybody that's on this call today needs to go in and, and just poke around. Um, there's a lot of good information. There's fact sheets, there's frequently asked questions, there's downloadable information as far as instructions for the employer, the employee. It's all really good stuff. Um, one thing you could do on there right now is you could purchase your query plans as well. 
Uh, it's discussed, you can browse the FAQs, and then there's a learning center to learn even more than what we talked about today. Here's also my information. Um, that's my phone number there, as you can see also my email. Um, Aaron Black as well is our director of business development, uh, who's well versed in all of this stuff as well. He can answer a lot of questions um, that you would have as well. Like I said, if, if, if something was not able to be answered on the website, feel free to reach out to me and I'd be happy to ask you or answer your questions. At this point, Ted, was there any other uh, questions that came through? Uh, not at the moment. And again, just to remind anyone on the call, you can ask questions. You're on mute. Uh, you can ask questions through the question feature and go to webinar. Um, I'm look, Actually, one just came in. Can we have a copy of the presentation to print out? The answer is yes. This is being recorded. And as long as you participated uh, or logged on to the webinar today, you will automatically receive a copy um, 24 hours after the webinar is over so you'll receive that tomorrow morning and again it will be a live recording uh, i will talk to michael about uh having ac the actual pdf um to be able to distribute as well um and if you want to um <clears throat> if you would like a copy of that please reach out to me and uh, i will work on trying to get that to you uh mike one question i had for you from my end i've heard concerns from uh, and I don't know if this is fact or myth, but concerns that the actual portal for FMCSA, uh, there could be issues as everyone kind of waits, theoretically waits until the, the, the day of the deadline or the, you know, the day before the deadline with essentially an overload of people trying to do this. Is there any real benefit from a, um, other than being proactive? Uh, have you heard that concern at all in regards to potential website issues with FM, FMCSA? Yeah, so through anything that I have, or through all the clients that I've currently dealt with to help them get uh, set up, this is the process in, the, in this picture right here that you're seeing that is the most difficult. It's very confusing, actually. So I do think everybody's going to run into some sort of issue when they're trying to register. So that is the importance of doing it early so we can get it all the, the quirks figured out before the, the deadline, which is, like I said, January 6th. This FMCSA portal account, it is good to have. However, through all the instructions and everything you see on the website, nothing discusses this. Um, like I said, you, when you actually go to register, you'll be prompted to this screen right here where it says register for the FMCSA portal account. When you register for that, then this is basically the screen that you would have. However, people still don't know that they have to go in and add these rules, the DACH, like I said, that's the Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. We have to add those rules for you to be able to use the Clearinghouse website. And like I said, I don't know, it's, it's a quirky thing. I have no idea why they didn't list this as, as part of the instructions, but you have to do this to be able to use it. Okay, uh, I, we did get some other questions here. If an owner is also a driver in the company, that has other drivers and someone else within the company who does all the queries for the drivers, pull the owners for him without going outside the company to have someone do that Third party. query. Yeah. Yeah, that's okay. So for instance, if you have a you know, an administrator or something like that in the office, um, as long as the guy's not pulling it on himself, that that's that's okay. Okay. Can you register multiple companies to one email? That's a good question. Um, I do not believe so, actually. I think that you have to have separate emails because uh, we did this. I have a company that has uh, about six or seven trucking companies kind of under the same roof. Um, when we did it for them, when we put the email in to register the other company, it said that this is already a registered email address. So I believe that answer would be no. Okay. When would the when would the yearly report be run on this new portal? I think so, you're talking about I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, so basically there's no information in there right now. So January sixth, there's no point to pull it on January sixth for your current employees, the annual query because there's no information. So right. as far as I know, we need to pull it next January on all of our current employees. However, after January 6th, 
any new hires we bring on, we do have to do that full query on that person and they would have to release the consent via electronically. Right. Yeah. And I think just to, I think you answered it, but to follow up, I, I think at some point in the presentation, you were, you were saying you need to, you need to submit an annual uh, report. And I'm, I think that's the basis of this question. So is it, a, is it an end of year report? Is it, um, yeah, is it every, every anniversary January. Of, the, of the portal? Yeah. Every January we'd have to do that. And, and then they do make it easy. So for instance, say you have 60 employees, which is not unusual. Uh, 60 CDL drivers, whatever it may be. Um, they do have a, uh, and the website is not complete yet either. That's the other thing that's kind of quirky about it. Like I said, that's why I would get in and register. Uh, but once it's completed, um, they have a way of, I think it's an Excel spreadsheet. Basically what you would do is list all the employers, na employees' names with their CDL numbers. Uh, and then you could actually upload that as one, and then they would spit back to you all the information. So they do make it easy on that front. Okay. Uh, earlier in the presentation, I think this is where this question is coming from, but you had a, uh, you had a screenshot of a form, uh, and the direct question is, where can we find a copy of the consent form for our current employees? Yeah, let me get back to that here. Um, that's actually on the website. So they have this, this form right here. It's a sample format, a general consent form for the limited queries. Um, if you go on the FMCSA website, this, that's where it's available. Um, like I said, though, they have it in PDF, so you kind of got to type up your own information, put it on your own uh, letterhead. Um, but if you look in this, what's up on your screen right now, if you see, um, they said whether you can do a single query or multiple queries, like I said, I would word it to say unlimited for the time of employment, basically. This way you're covered. You don't have to have them sign something every single year. Okay. Uh, this is a, I think a follow up on our, on one of the previous questions asked, but when will limited queries be required to be done in future years of current employees? Yeah, so and it needs I, to be I, done in. Re reading that as current employees as of right now today and, and theoretically, you know, you may or may not register them within the, within the clearinghouse. Yeah, you don't have to. Like I said, the, this, this paper format that you see right here is what you could have your current employees do. And then you wouldn't pull their full queries on them until next year um, because there'd be no information in there. But just remember for, like I said, new hires coming on, you'd have to do the, the electronic consent. And then also you have to do that paper format that we discussed. And that's the current process. Uh, do the, par the paper format for the next three years. Okay. Um, at the moment, there's no other questions. I'm going to give it. 20 seconds here to see if anything else comes in. And like I said earlier, just to add, um, I hope that this this PowerPoint here was, was informational to everybody and educational. Um, but I do suggest everybody gets on the website and pokes around because there's just a lot of information, good information uh, to learn more about it. Okay, we we have not had anything else come in, so at this point we're going to wrap up. If you have um, if you have any questions after the fact, you want to get in touch with us as in the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association, uh, please please do so. We will do our best to to help you out. Um, uh, you know, Michael's company, of course, specializes in this as well, and that is another option in regards to guidance. And um, and there's other other companies out there that that also can help you out. So. Um, again, please use us as a resource. Um, and at this point, Mike, thank you very much. Um, very informative. Appreciate your time. And, and thank you, everyone, that who joined us this morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.